This is the Rebel Author Podcast, where we talk about books, business, and occasionally bad words. Hello, and welcome back to the Rebel Author Podcast, episode 15. Today's podcast is all about life, the universe, and everything in between. I'll be speaking to Rachel Heron in a moment, and boy, are you in for a treat. We go deep, or, well, Rachel digs deep, Uh, and that's one of the things that I love about her. She has this way of digging under the skin and getting to the questions that are, you know, philosophical, um, and she also makes me confess a few things. But first to last week's question. I asked what you guys do for a book launch or what your favourite authors do. Tom Fowler answered he doesn't dump a ton into the launch because he prefers bank over rank. Uh, His general plan though for fiction is to get read through. So he reveals the title to his mailing list about four to six weeks out. He lines up promotions, you know, with like the book barbs or the fussy librarian, um, all of those kinds of things. He will do a cover reveal to his ARC team primarily and then to his regular list about four weeks before he launches. And then he does um, multiple promotions. So um, he'll do price differentials, changing the price, increasing it as um, it gets closer to launch and well, not closer to launch as it goes through the launch. Um, He'll also, he does cool things like adding the first couple of chapters of a preview uh, in the prior book. So he'll change Um, his old books back matter to include the chapters of a of the new book which I think is ingenious and guess what I'm going to be doing this evening Um, he also updates the back matter including links uh, for other titles and um, yeah uh, basically his priority is to make sure that um, all of those those things and the links are all up to date when uh, the promotions start because obviously you're gaining a lot of traffic uh, with each of those books that are being promoted and obviously he will run Facebook and AMS ads on launch day too. Um, He says that his uh, series is in KU so the pre-order pimping doesn't really work that well for him. Um, So for him it's more about uh, launch day and going forward. Uh, Ritu has a different um, launch plan so hers is more around social media, arranging a blog tour, um, giving out art copies uh, so that the reviews are posted on either blog, websites or social media. She arranged a social media campaign too where her book and pre-order graphics are being shared in relevant groups and she tries to post it wherever she can. I also have another shout out this week, uh, which was from Shari. So Shari says, hi, Sasha, just finished listening to Chris Kennedy's interview and I couldn't and it couldn't have been more timely. I'm taking a small detour from my usual genre of historical women's fiction to write a Christmas romance. Loved your interview and gathered up all kinds of craft goodies. And I have to say, I think Chris's uh, podcast has provoked the largest number of comments I've had since starting the podcast. So it obviously resonated. And for anybody who skipped last week's podcast, I highly recommend you go back and listen to it. I've heard from a lot of people who gained a ton of craft tips and tricks from it, myself included. So to this week's question... Later on in today's podcast, I uh, one of the topics that comes up is self-care or my lack of it. So my question to, to you is, what do you do for self-care? Let me know in the comments. Let me know on the blog post. Let me know in my Facebook group. Tweet me um, at Rebel Author Pod, but let me know what is your favorite type of self-care. This week's book recommendation is Chillpreneur by Denise Duffield Thomas. This is one of the books that... Uh, Rachel recommends in the podcast and also my dear friend Katie sent me uh, a copy to read so I have just finished it and I really really enjoyed it Um, kind of a girl power book but I think anybody reading it would gain a lot from it Um, I found it motivational and I even finished it by listening to the audiobook I think you guys will like it so in personal progress oh 
OMG, I finally finished editing The Anatomy of Prose. It is now with my critique partner and I, I don't know how you guys feel when you finish um, drafts or edits or your book, but I tend to <laughs> mentally throw myself off a cliff into a pit of despair. I, the closer it gets to um, publication, the more I struggle. And this is just me being completely honest. I just question myself about everything. You know, was it, um, is it good enough? Who am I to be doing this? And and we, I have a whole podcast coming on self-doubt and um, imposter syndrome soon. But yeah, I am struggling. If I'm honest, it, it feels like there's more pressure to, you know, and I know it's also psychological and I'm just making it up and it's completely my own mental bullshit but I like to be honest with you guys so yeah that is that is where I am and I'm not gonna lie I am scared about publishing this book but because I have finished the edit and it's with my critique partner I think I think I have a launch date. I'm not going to give a very specific launch date today, but I'm going to say that I'm tentatively looking at around the end of March, early April-ish. And that's as specific as I'm going to be. Uh, it was one of my quarterly goals to get it published, but um, because it's done, I'm kind of okay. I know that even if I push it into April, just so that I can be a bit more organized with the launch prep and planning and, and campaign, I'm fine because I have done it and it will, it will be on pre-order. So it's still a tick in my box. But yes, I am hoping for late March, but we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. Okay, listener rebel of the week this week is Ireland Gill. Ireland says, I recently discovered that two of my three daughters, aged 17 and 14, were experimenting with this new hip thing of vaping. So vaping is like an e-cigarette. And I'm sure most of the rebels in the world have, you know, tried a cigarette in their teenage years. I know I did. Nobody tell my mother. Um, anyway, the age at which these products can be sold in the United States is actually 21. So Ireland marched into the vape shop where she knew that they'd been purchased and told the shop owner that uh, she wanted to start vaping. She never had before, but she was going to make it her new habit. He looked at me like I was crazy, but after I told him my 14 and 17 year olds were coming here to buy his stuff um, and somehow, despite them being underage, were able to purchase it, she figured she was going to jump on the bandwagon and see what happened. If she has to watch her kids getting addicted to um, this stuff, then she might as well get addicted as well. At that point, he looked at her like she was a psycho mum. But you know what? Fuck it. She was proud of it. Um, she put the vape in her back pocket and whipped it out during the confrontation with her kids, shocking them to their core. It's been four days now and she's gotten a whole lot of truth out of her daughters. They are scared out of their minds at her behaviour, for which I'm glad. Uh, it was meant to shock them. And she's also managed to make it so uncool that they now don't want anything to do with vaping anymore. And as a bonus rebel move, she reported the vape shop to the city's police for underage sales. I love that you, uh, <laughs> the way that you got them to stop doing this was by doing it yourself because you made it uncool. Like, I... <laughs> really hoped I was never going to be that uncool mum but I think we all get there whether we want to admit it or not so good for you for being protective and looking out for your girls and to write on reporting uh, the shop as well because you know none of us want our kids being exposed to that stuff if you would like to be a rebel of the week, please do send in your story. It can be any kind of rele rebellion. Yes, you know, send me in your rebellions. Uh, it can be any type of rebellion, uh, big or small. You can email your rebel story to rebelauthorpodcast at gmail.com or you can tweet me at rebelauthorpod. No new patrons today, but thank you to all of my current patrons who help to ensure that this podcast continues to run. 
If you would like to support the show and get access to all of the bonus essays, posts, content, sneak peeks, previews, cover reveals, and um, more, you can by visiting www.patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black, and that's Sasha with a C. And you can support the show from as little as just $2 a month. Let's get on with the show. Hello and welcome back to the Rebel Author Podcast. Today I am with Rachel Heron. Rachel is the internationally best-selling author of more than two dozen books, including Thriller under R.H. Heron, Mainstream Fiction, Feminist Romance, Memoir and Nonfiction about writing. She received her MFA in writing from Mills College, Oakland, and she teaches writing extension workshops at both U. UC Berkeley and Stanford. She's a proud member of the NaNoWriMo Writers Board. She's a New Zealand citizen as well as an American. Hello. Hello. And basically, I need you to know that I just want to listen to your voice for the rest of my life. You have <laughs> the perfect podcasting voice. <laughs> oh, thank you. Do you know, it's funny you say that. Um, that is actually why I started podcasting. I had a few people tell me um, that they could listen to me all day. <laughs> it's just like, yeah. but I just waffle bollocks. <laughs> like... <laughs> it doesn't matter. We just want to hear you do that. Waffling bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so much. It really does mean a lot to me. Also, I'm a bit of a cheater in that um, when I was a teen, I had an agent and I did voiceover and TV work. So I... Yeah. I, I did have some training, so yeah. that's so interesting. As a kid, you I know, did that. I know. I, but this, oh, it's terrible. It's a terrible story. I shouldn't. This is so, so negative. But I'm going to tell you anyway. I um, I got, I got, yeah. So I was, I did. Have you ever heard of S Club Seven? No. Okay. Well, they were like a teeny boppy teenage band, and I did all of their like CD ROMs because that's how old I am. And um, <laughs> and then um, I did a TV show, and I was on like the UK version of what must be um, wait no like Cartoon Network or something in America. Right. Um, right. And I was the main lead, but then I got bullied really badly. And I never acted again. <laughs> and that is the end of that story. <laughs> the voice people were bullies? Yeah. No, no. The children back at my school were awful. Oh, yeah. oh you're kidding. No, yeah. Oh, because you were too big for your britches. Apparently. Oh, well, that's terrible. I'm yeah. sorry that happened to you. Oh, well, fuck them. Now I'm a rebel podcaster. <laughs> <laughs> and they... Or not. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And I get to talk to awesome people, so, you know, who's <laughs> laughing now? Um, <laughs> anyway, forget me. Tell me about you. Um, I would love to know more about your journey. I know that you're a hybrid author. You have um, lots of different uh, income streams. I know you have a really um, amazing, multifaceted business. So tell me about you. How did you get to where you are now? Ooh, lots and lots of work. So much work. I think um, uh, the thing that I always like to remind myself of the most is on a day like this where I've kind of been fighting a headache and and lying around and whining about not getting my words done, I have to remind myself that I spent 10 years, 10 full years writing full time and working at my day job for between 60 and 80 hours a week. So uh, it was just, I don't have kids, you know, um, so that yeah, I just worked all the time. And that makes me so grateful today that I even get to be whiny, you know, but, um, but how I got to be a full-time writer was a typical story. I wanted to write from the time I was a reader, yada, yada. And one day I realized that there was a person behind the books that I loved so much. And I wanted to be that person. I wanted to be the person who was kind of hiding behind the books and I still want to be that person <laughs> and uh but I but I you know everybody told me you couldn't do that so I went to school for business and I completely faffed around for like you know seven or eight years failing miserably in college trying to be a business major and then I just changed my major to English and graduated immediately and went on to get a master's and then I went on to spend the next seven years after my master's writing just I was trying to write the great American novel and I was not writing any I was I was like writing a very poor American chapter um 
you know, 500 pages of it. And then, you know, another 300 page novel that went nowhere. They were all character sketches. And if I'm not careful still, that's what I write. I just write, you know, 300 pages of a character sketch and then I have to add some plot to it. That is a problem. <laughs> um, we all have our vices. Uh, we do. <laughs> <laughs> we do. Some people write plot and forget to put character development in. That is not my problem. Uh, but I, but I, so I spent years and years trying to do that and really failing. And then in 2006, my sister told me about Nano, which is National Novel Writing, Writers Month, which just finished. And uh, and I told her she was a, an idiot and not no real self-respecting writer would ever try to write a book in a month and i laughed her out of the house and as soon as she left i'm exaggerating a little bit um, as soon as she left i did google the site and i just signed up i thought this is crazy this is stupid so i must do it and i can't do it and i can't write a great literary novel in four weeks so i will write about what I love and I love love and I love romance and I also really 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 love knitting so I wrote Knitlet it was not a thing yet um there were no there were no knitting romances out there yet um so I was one of the first on the <laughs> on the scene for that um but that book actually turned out to be terrible number one but when I looked back at it like six months later I dragged it out and and actually took an objective look at it again and it was really terrible but there were parts in it that were better than anything else I'd ever written because I was just having fun and I had just gotten out of my editor's way and I had been one of those typical writers who thought I had to you know get chapters one through three right before I moved on to chapter four mm. and so I never moved much past chapter four or five um, and now I'm of the complete conviction that most writers if they think revising as they go is their method as I did that is only true if you're completing books that you're proud of if you think re revising as you go is your method, but you're not completing books, it's not your method. You are more of a, of a you must finish a terrible draft like 99% of the rest of writers and then make it into something not terrible later. But the whole trick is getting the words on the page, which is what Nano just really ripped off, ripped open for me to see. And I revised that book. Um, I make it sound so easy, but it, it wasn't. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And... Then I, in the same manner, I found an agent. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Um, queried, queried for a long time, got a lot of rejections stacked up. And uh, then suddenly I had two agents interested at the same time. So I got to kind of, you know, pick the one I loved. And I'm still with her. That was 11 years ago. Um, and she sold that book at auction to HarperCollins in a three book deal. And so that was kind of the the fairy tale come true, right? It had, it had really happened. Um, and I, I, I like to, you, know, I, you might know from listening to my show, but I like to talk about real numbers uh, because no one knows in this industry what yeah. we're talking about. Like, what is it? What is an auction book deal? So it went for six figures, 110,000. So that was like $37,000 per book, uh, which after taxes and everything, I was bringing home around eight, around 20,000 of that um, per book, each book. There was a book a year so. I couldn't quit the day job on $20,000, you know, a year. Um, and those books completely bombed. <laughs> so well, the first book sold the best. It, all, it almost turned out. Um, the second book came out the week the borders closed. So it came out to crickets and no sales for anyone that in those few months. And the third book did even worse. Uh, interestingly, they had been bought by um, HarperCollins in the, in the States, but Random House in Australia and New Zealand. And I became a uh, Southern Cross bestseller down there. People really liked my voice there um, in Australia and New Zealand. And so they kept the, the series continuing um, because, well, HarperCollins wouldn't, you know, would have pushed me into the dark alley that I came out of. Um, and rightfully so. I wasn't selling for them. Random House wanted me to keep going. So I kept writing. Um, I wrote two more books in that series and a novella and that's how I became hybrid is my, I, my, my name was mud in America. My agent could not sell those other romances, especially that they were books four and five in a series and Harper Collins, while they couldn't sell one through three, they're not, they weren't going to sell us the right back, the rights back, um, or anything like that. So nobody wanted those books. And this was right around, yeah, it would have been right around 2011 or so, um, 
that I wrote those and just self-published them myself because I could. I had the right to do all territories except for Australia and New Zealand. And I learned everything about self-publishing through that venture. And I learned that I'm good at it and that I really like it. I really, really enjoy the process of being self-published. So now um, I think I'm working on book 26. And I did the numbers the other day. I think um, 14 of them are traditional published. And the others are all self-published. So I'm pretty pretty even, even out. Um, last year I made exactly the same amount of money for TradPub that I did on self-pub. Um, I am a six-figure author for the last two years, which is crazy to me. But I would say that, you know, usually it's not more than forty or $50,000 of that is um, book money. It's, it's the, the other half is all hustle. It's coaching and teaching and um, Patreon. And like you said, all of those different methods of income. And I really... I am just so happy when one one stream of income gives me, you know, $50. I was like, yes, $50. You know, that's going to go towards this. And that's how we make this this writing life work. But um, about four years ago, I was able, almost four years ago now, I was close enough to bringing in just the bare minimum um, from writing that I could quit my job and still make up my half of the of the mortgage and all of our our, our stuff. My wife she has the insurance for us um so that's great in in america i could not have quit if she if she hadn't had that insurance um and then my mother-in-law got sick a few months before i was going to leap and so i left a little bit early i was like why am i spending time saving up a little bit more money where i when i could you know leave the state and go be with my beloved mother-in-law so that's how i made the leap and for the last you know a little bit more than three and a half years i have been terrified every single month <laughs> that i'm going to end up living under a bridge so far we are still in the house like I make a lot more writing now than I did when I quit and I was just thinking about that today driving home uh, because when I quit I knew that I needed to make I think I can't, I can't remember if it was 36 or forty two thousand dollars a year that's what I needed to make to make my half of the bills and and pay everything that was bare minimum and it's only gone up since then it's gone up every year by at least 17 percent and then it jumped into into the sixes so that gives me a lot of hope <laughs> There are so many things I want to come back to you on this. Um, before we, before we, before we delve into uh, the millions of questions that I want to ask you, um, Nano Rimo. So tell me. So you talked a little bit there about um, vomiting the first draft versus revising as you go, um, and that you couldn't get past three or four chapter three or four because you were editing. So <clears throat> excuse me. Tell me about your process now. Do you still write linearly or do you write all over the place? How does that work? I wish I could write all over the place. I am such a boring, linear person that I write the book from beginning to end. And what that usually means is I write all of the scenes in the car when they were moving from A to B. And then I write the toothbrushing scene because I don't know, maybe it'll mean something. So I write these incredibly boring scenes that are later axed. So I'm an overwriter. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, and you know, it's like curly hair versus straight hair. You always want what you are not, you know, and I would love to be an underwriter so that then I could go in and, and in second drafts, make everything, you know, more beautiful and bigger and everything. Instead, I'm always just trying to, you know, trim the weeds. Um, and I still do the vomit draft. I still, write a draft as fast as I possibly can. And it's only this year that I have, I've been thinking a lot about just, you know, bigger things. Entering middle age, you start to think about, you really start to think about, you know, who you are and who you've been and why you've been that way. And I'm learning how much of a control freak I am and how I would like to run the world and I can't run anything, <laughs> even myself much of the time. Uh, and I realized that that is why I've had such a hard time with first drafts for the last 11 years, um, 12 years, is that when you're first drafting, for me anyway, I feel very out of control. I, I'm not a good outliner. My best ideas come to me while I'm writing, and I know that. Um, and I do have to write an outline nowadays, especially like for the book I just sold, it needed to be completely outlined out with a full synopsis, which was agony to me. Um, but, but that feeling of loss of control, now that I've named it, it's gotten a lot easier. Now I know, oh, you hate this because you, you are, you have no control over this process. You're vomiting terrible words out that you cannot control. And it's fine. This is just the way it goes. And later in revision, 
which I love, I will, I will have fun again. But just knowing that it's about loss of control has made first drafting fun for me again. That I find that so fascinating because I used to vomit and, and I would vomit hard and fast. Oh, and, yes. Yeah, yes. and I would get to the end of the book. Um, and I have not published in nearly a year. So I am having, I, I've had, now there are many causes for why I have not published. First, I've transitioned. So I've left my full-time employment to being full-time by myself. Oh, um, terrifying. Yeah. Second, it, it, just a number of burnouts <laughs> over the course of the last year. And Seriously? Yeah, 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 it really is. And also um, then, <clears throat> excuse me, loads of just all that mental bullshit that writers give themselves, like, you know, imposter syndrome, fear, because now I'm not on the first book anymore. And, you know, also I write nonfiction. I teach other writers. So, you know, I'm like, oh, but what if oh. I'm not good? Off. and you know and so I just can't seem to finish but also um I think I may have had an epiphany here this evening because I have started to edit as I write so I so I'm still I'm still very much a vomiter but I will vomit sort of 20,000 words and then but I don't write in order so I write completely out of sequence so I just oh. I'm just no 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 it no. sounds so, it's oh, awful. It sounds so creative. No, it's awful. It, you have to puzzle this thing together and then there's always shit that needs removing and then you have an epiphany. So of course you have to rewrite the first 30,000 words five fucking times, you know. <laughs> so, the grass, this grass, it's not greener, I promise you. <laughs> it is definitely not dear. greener. <laughs> yeah. Um but no, I I I feel like I need to give myself permission to um just just keep vomiting and just fix it later so yeah thank that's, you isn't that where we get our I mean for me that's where everything comes from is and I could even sit down and say wow I'm not creative today but I know as soon as I start typing ideas will start to burble up the muse definitely comes and like you know pokes me in the head while I'm working and at no other time I'm not a person who gets incredible ideas in the shower or when I'm uh. falling asleep it, I am. Are you? Yeah. No. Usually, when I'm driving and have no ability to write anything down, (laughs) and I'm like, hold the idea. (laughs) That does that does stir things up. And just this in the last few months, I've been um, keeping a notebook every single place I am. There's a notebook on my desk. There's one in my car door. There's one right next to the bed, and there's one in the kitchen. So and in my and in my bag. So there's always a notebook. And then I, you know, and I've actually been using it. A little bit. Yeah, that is a really good idea. I am actually going to put a notebook in my car tomorrow morning. <laughs> yes, it's in the door. The pen is attached. There's yeah. no way you can get lost. And you don't have to look while you drive. And it's, yeah. it's easier for me than my phone when I'm driving because I'm just not that. I mean, I do look at my phone to change podcasts and stuff, but I don't want to type. So, yeah, yeah it's yeah. easy. <laughs> Amazing. Um, <clears throat> oh, there's so many things I, w- I want to um, ask, but I, I fear I will literally take up your entire day. So <laughs> let me ask one of the questions I'm supposed to be asking. <laughs> um, okay, so we haven't actually mentioned your podcast yet. So um, I know you have more than one. Uh, the one that I have been binge listening to of late is called The Writer's Well. Um, so for anybody who is listening who hasn't listened to The Writer's Well, stop whatever you're doing actually no don't keep listening but after <laughs> after you've finished listening <laughs> go listen to the right as well it's amazing what I love about your podcast is that it's so it's almost philosophical it's reflective it goes deep it gets under the skin and oh god I just love that it makes me stop and think about my own journey and you know taking those moments out of the busy uh, just to really reflect and look at where we are so for anybody who likes that kind of stuff please go listen I love it um but thank you the question that I want to ask is um around some of the episodes that have called to me personally I have a real um interest at the moment about money and debt and being you know to get to to be able to leave my job I had to pay off 40,000 pounds worth of debt in about three years so I'm so proud of you thank you I it was never really intentional I had student loans then we had fertility treatments and um I had to pay off a car so it wasn't it wasn't frivolous spending but it it you know it had to be paid off because otherwise Mm -hmm. I was never leaving the job I hated Mm -hmm. um but 
one of the things that you and Jay talk about is multiple streams of income. And I think a lot of listeners would like to leave their jobs and multiple streams of income, in my humble opinion, is one of the fastest ways to do that. So could you tell everybody what multiple streams of income are, what they look like to you? And um, yeah, so let's start there. <laughs> okay, this is, I, I love this because I just don't think we talk about money enough. I had a, an article come out in uh, the Writer Magazine, which is an American, I think it's the oldest writing magazine in America um, recently about money and about shame and about how we just don't talk about it with our cubicle mates, you know, every, and it's, I, I don't, I don't know how it is there, but here money is for showing off. It's never for talking about honestly. Um, so I always love to talk about money and I, and I love to talk about debt because I think that um, I was, we were drowning in it. At one point we were, we paid off $120,000 of debt. And that was an old tax bill of Lala's that my wife's that caught up with her $40,000 worth of credit card debt that we got into when we were trying to save my old condo for, from foreclosure and back in the, back in the aughts, which we did not manage to do. Um, Oh, 50,000 words, uh, dollars, uh, 50,000 words. That just <laughs> flew off my, <laughs> flew off my lips there. $50,000 worth of, um, uh, student debt and it was just shackling us and I had these big dreams of leaving this job that I worked 60 to 80 hours a week doing and didn't you know I enjoyed parts of it but most of the time I was pretty miserable and I just had this realization one day I could not leave without paying off the debt we, there was no I think that most people unless you have a partner who can take care of you in a way in which I would love to become accustomed to yeah um, wouldn't yeah, we all <laughs> yeah exactly wouldn't we? Um, but we can't, we cannot become a full-time author. Um, unless that debt is paid, we cannot take that leap without doing it. So I really put all of my back into paying that off. I, um, I highly recommend a tool called YNAB, which is you need a budget, uh, you need a budget.com. It's a, it's an online app and it is, it taught me how to use money at 40 years old. I still did not know how money worked. And after using YNAB for a while, it's not really a budgeting tool. It's more like just, it's just like an eye opener of a tool. It's like mint or quicken or any of those other things, but it's, it's different. And I am such, I, I, I proselytize for it everywhere because after, you know, a few months of, of using it, I told my wife, I'm like, did you know that every single animal we have, and I think at that point we had like six or seven, um, costs us a hundred dollars a month. Yeah. So each animal costs us, it uh, cost us a hundred dollars a month, which was insane to me. And it just was, and it kept happening to me. Like we spend that much on car registration a year. We spend that much. And that's why we were always living month to month up until this point and having emergencies that would then cripple us. So YNAB really taught me how to allocate funds to the things that were actually going to happen. And we paid off the debt. Um, and, and what I really saw happen was were these multiple streams of income. And for me, what multiple streams of income looks like, to get to your question, um, I've always been wide on all platforms. I, I am not a proponent of putting all my chips on Amazon and letting the roulette wheel roll. Uh, I have a very strong love-hate relationship with Amazon. Um, hmm. They pay some of my bills. So thank you, Amazon. I am having groceries delivered this afternoon via Amazon Prime. So that's amazing. But also they're so scary. They could they could change everything we know tomorrow with a stroke of the pen. So I publish everywhere. I publish wide on all the platforms. I do um, print for everything. I'm available in libraries. I do audio, of course, for everything. And I have, I've never done a royalty share. I've always kept the rights for myself, which means that there are some books that I have, you know, contracted out to audio artists that have never earned out yet. They've never, never paid themselves, but I believe in having that money there. Um, let's see. I teach quite a bit. I teach, like you mentioned at Berkeley and Stanford. Um, I regret my MFA in many ways, but I because it was just a load of money down the drain and I didn't learn how to write a book. I learned how to write a book by writing books and by attending organizations like Romance Writers of America. Um, that's where I really got my education. But I'm so grateful to the masters because that means I can teach in these programs. And 
I think most life changing for me though, in terms of, you know, and then I write articles for magazines and that kind of thing, but most life changing for me was when Patreon came on the scene and suddenly there was this way to monetize, to basically pay my own royalties. Um, as I'm writing books, I've written two full, uh, memoirs under Patreon, a chapter a month. And people who support me on Patreon have been paying for those essays. And because I have to produce it every month, I'm on a per thing basis at Patreon. So if I don't produce a chapter, I do not get paid. And that has made me write two full books. So I'm like, uh, you know, I'm working on the third now of these with people's support and these people support in, you know, $1 amounts or $5 amounts. And that was honestly the bump that allowed me to leave work. I was so close to be able to being able to leave my job. And then Patreon came out probably six months before I left. And I thought, oh my gosh, here's this extra $1,500 a month that now it feels a little bit safer. Patreon could also fold tomorrow. I don't like to rely on anything Mm. over much. Um, And in fact, I was, we, you know, we are, we are not rich. We're always, we have, you know, we're really trying to save now for retirement and things like that. Um, I need to make more money, but just recently I actually cut down on some of my Patreon work because I was coaching um, through Patreon at a, at the hundred dollar level, I would read your work and coach you every month. And I had 10 of those people, which was fantastic. There's a thousand dollars. And I just fired them all recently because I was facing some serious burnout and I had to let something go. And so <laughs> I, I took that thousand dollars off my plate and my wife is like, what? You did what? <laughs> <laughs> but burnout is so real and I can really attest to to what burnout is doing to me. I just had to, um, I've taken a three month pause. So I do developmental editing and I've had to take, um, reduce the number of clients and and put a limit on how many clients I take just because um, my, I'm only 32 and my body is falling apart. Like Mm. literally falling apart. Bits of me are breaking off. Like I can't, I just, you know, this should not be happening to a 32 year old. I haven't been well since September, you know, and that is not okay for a 32 year old. You should be healthy and in your prime and blah, blah, blah. But yeah, it's, it is, it is real. I I wanted to ask you two things um, on the things that you just said. Um, first one, I wanted to delve a little bit more into the shame and why you think people feel shame because I totally agree. And, you know, in England, we have our stiff upper lip and, you know, we, we don't talk about these things only to judge others on what their job is. You know, that is all we do here. Um, and sorry for any British people listening. I do obviously love you all. Um, but you know, we do like to judge and have a stiff upper lip. Um, um, and and the other one is to ask you um, two questions. Sorry, I'm so bad. I'm just like all of the questions. Um, do you feel like a full time writer? And what does your working week look like? Because okay. lots of people say to me, "Oh, you're not a full time writer." And I'm like, "But I am because I'm not in an office anymore, and I can choose what I want to write." You know. So let's yeah, start. tell me. Let's start there. Let's start there. Actually, you are a full time writer. I am a full time writer. I realized this once when I, I did this thing um, for the first year or so after I left my job. I tracked my hours, as if I were a lawyer or something, or as if I were going to you know pay myself according to every fifteen minute segment that I spent doing things, and I was only writing at max when I'm writing a first draft, I can't do more than like two hours a day of first drafting. And then I just want to kill myself. So, um, (laughs) that was the time I was spending writing, um, or revising, revising I can do for longer, but, but a lot of the days I wasn't even getting to that. And I, but every single thing I was doing was contributing to bringing money in to, to my household using my brain, which understands words. So I, 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 I completely empathize with what you said about editing for the first I think probably first year I was full-time writing, I edited and I, I, now I hate nothing more. There is just this part of my brain that I'm good at it, but I get 
furious at having to spend my brain cells on someone else's work. And it absolutely was preventing me from working on my own. So that was another hit like the Patreon. I just, I do not developmental edit at all anymore. And I could never copy edit because I can't catch any typos. I'm just yeah. one of the, <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> just not, not good enough for that. But, um, but I was, I was rageful when I was doing that. And, uh, um, but as long as you are using your brain and your talent with words to bring in some bucks, you're a full-time writer. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. But while I was tracking my time, I would, I would have these, um, very uh, smug days where I would, you know, tell myself and whoever would listen that, well, you know, I, I worked, you know, it was a nine and a half hour day today. It was a 10 hour day. And, <laughs> and finally I realized, you know, I finally realized like, what the hell am I doing? What is this shit? I, I write full time and if I want to write, if I want to work, whatever that looks like for me, six hours a day, more power to me. I still have this inordinate amount of guilt though around how hard I should be working because like, I hate it. Like this morning I went out to write and I was out very early. I was out writing at the library near me. I, can't, I didn't do very many words because I was not feeling well. So I drove home because I was going to take a nap and my wife's car's in the driveway. And I was like, oh, God damn it. Because I don't like her to know that I nap. <laughs> she gets her little booty up and gets on the train and commutes, you know, for an hour and a half a day to go work in the city at this web development job. And I'm like, I got, you know. I'm a little tired and I'm going to go back to bed. You know, that's not okay. And it is okay. That's the thing. It is okay. I don't, she, she holds, she holds no resentment about this. None. Literally. I'm the one holding the resentment toward myself for, you know, have, ha having worked very hard to get to this point where I can do this. Um, but so I think I'm working backwards with your questions. So what the day looks like, um, an ideal day, uh, I, start writing pretty early any time between like 5 a.m. and 7 a.m. I know. <laughs> As a hardened night owl, I think I just just herniated a bit of lung or something. <laughs> I am so, I'm not a night owl or a morning person. I'm really like, I would, I would really? like to be awake. Really? 5 a.m.? p.m. I know, I, I, it, but I, I worked this, I worked this 911 job for so long. So now I'm used to getting up at any time, but, um, but it works really well for me if I get it over with and just rip the bandaid off and get my writing done. And then I could spend the whole rest of the day. So usually, so to answer your question, I write until usually between 10 and noon. Um, I try to do my writing and try not to look at email or anything else. And, and that's on an ideal day. Usually I glance at email and then I'm screwed. Uh, but the rest of the day is spent doing things like podcasting and writing other things and the marketing that I really should do, but don't. <laughs> uh, I've recently hired an incredible virtual assistant who lives here in Oakland and he's really been just helping me so much do all of those like big marketing things that I should have done, like make this series a box set, which I'd never gotten around to, you know, he's handling all those kind of things. So that has been fabulous. Um, and then I, try not to work in the evenings ever or weekends i really try to keep bankers hours as much as possible yeah i should i should do that <laughs> what, yeah. what, what, you know what i would a i would ask you what yours is but i've already decided that i love you and i want you on my podcast which is all <laughs> of, which is called how do you write and it's about process so on that show i'm going to pick your brains about how you work is that okay okay yeah of course i'd be honored and there um and then um to your first question which was about shame and debt um debt is a debt is a shameful thing debt debt is something that says i failed right i i needed to do this or i wanted to do this and i didn't have the funds to do it so i did it anyway and there are good reasons to do that student loan um you know like, like you said um ivf treatments those are great reasons to spend money that we don't have but it feels wrong so therefore we don't talk about it and shame you know i love brene brown who does not love brene brown and her research on shame and everything that she has shown that shame exists in secrecy and as soon as you open it to the light and sh tell other people your shame, um, you are met with empathy and the shame disappears. And I've seen that happen over and over again. My, my I write right now I'm writing thriller. Um, 
for Penguin and I'm taking a break from romance, which I was self-publishing. But my thing that I love to write is memoir. That's my that's my jam. That's what I teach. That's what I write in the Patreon essays. And every single time I write an essay or I think I should not tell anybody this, this is the deepest, darkest secret yet, I am met with nothing but love and compassion and empathy and understanding. Um, yeah, so it's 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 just life-changing for me every time it happens. And I will tell you, I think I told Jay this once, um, but it's not something I advertise, but (laughs) about two years ago, um, I was feeling incredibly burned out, like burned out in a way that I'd never been before. And I could not, I could not write. I had had more than a year since a release. Um, I was doing everything I had to, to keep money coming in, like teaching and, and coaching and stuff, but nothing else, nothing extra. And, uh, I decided to write a book called Replenish. And in this book called Replenish, it was going to be a monthly essay exploration. I would try something that I thought might refill my well, and I would write about it. And it took me about four months of doing that to um, re- suddenly realize that I was an alcoholic. <laughs> and I had not seen that coming. I just knew I drank a lot. I didn't know. Well, I kind of knew, but I, I had never looked at it. And and that was an incredibly shameful thing to, number one, realize I didn't tell anybody for a few months. But I started to peel back that layer and show people that part of addiction. And I was met with nothing but love. But the, the funny part about it is, is that my <laughs> my brain said, ooh, you thought you'd written about all the shameful things. There's more. <laughs> <laughs> There's always more. There is always more. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, I just, I love... Um, every everything you've just said and thank you for sharing that as well um and also thank you for you know bringing up uh, Brene Brown it's Brene isn't it I I have her daring greatly on my um audible I've already purchased I just haven't listened yet um but I was ashamed of the debt and 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 when I paid it off I was like but why? Because none of the things that I'd done, you know, I had to buy a car because we had a child and the pram wouldn't fit in my other car. You know, we were told, I was told I couldn't have, I wouldn't have kids because I'd go through the menopause before I was 30. They got it wrong and I'm fine, but we didn't for a long time. Yeah, I know. It's a whole, that's a whole can of worms. (laughs) And I love my son (laughs) and it's fine. (laughs) But I was real pissed back then. Um, Yeah, but, you know, so, you know, we made these decisions and they had all these consequences and they were all the right decisions. And yet still I felt shame about them. Um, but yeah, you are absolutely money. money. I really like to think about money as energy and this really, it is energy that is, uh, you know, so we, none of us know how to control it. Mm -hmm. It's, it's really, it's really energy that is about our labor that then we trade for other people's labor. And because we don't understand it, it is having too much of it is shameful. Having not enough of it is shameful and having just the right amount. Nobody knows what that looks like. Mm. So there's, there's just no understanding about it. And the and the more we talk about it, the more we expose that, you know, the more everybody realizes, Oh, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing either. I'm 40 years old and I've never fucking, you know, managed to live more than month to month, you know, and back then my wife and I were making a great salary. I was making six figures at my job, day job and bringing in, you know, 30 or $40,000 from, from the writing. And still it's like money. We have none in the bank. Where did it go? Yeah. <laughs> yeah but I just, uh, so yes, all of the, yes to all of that. Um, okay. Right. I'm going to, um, force myself to move on. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I have two Patreon questions. Um, the first one is, as the industry continues to develop, what do you think are some of the innovative ways authors can maximize their income streams for books beyond the obvious multiple formats for things like ebooks, paperback, um, audio and foreign rights? Those are, those are all great. Um, and I, I just think that they're at, especially indie writers, especially indie writers, um, need to keep in mind that intellectual property is what we're is what, is what we own. It is what we sell. We don't write a book. We write a vehicle to turn into other things, and um, that is something I've always been aware of. But my virtual assistant Ed really points that out to me. He's like, "Well, we haven't we haven't done this with it yet. We haven't 
um, done that? Have you thought about doing, you know, a clothing line for this, you know, these firefighters, you could have the fire shirts, you could have, you know, um, you could have swag, you can have um, multiple forms of audio, the acted out ones. Um, Film rights is a, is a great one when you can get it. I have, I have one perhaps coming through. Who knows? Those are so nebulous. Um, but doing things, I think actually reaching out to the people who love you best, uh, your readers of any kind, and just knowing that they want to support you, I think is one of the things we overlook the most. Patreon directly addresses that. But there are times when... I have been able to reach out to readers for other kinds of help and they are there. And this is, this is a, this is a nonsense thing that I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't have to do now. Thank God. But, but, um, years ago I had a knitting blog before I ever sold a book. So I already, I always had a readership, um, that started in 2002. So I've had a readership since then. And one of my cats got really sick and he needed a surgery. And somebody told me, you know, this was maybe 2004 or so somebody said you should put it PayPal button on your site. And I did. And I just put one post that said, if you'd like to help towards digit surgery, because we were living paycheck to paycheck. Um, I didn't know how we we're going to pay this five grand bill and five grand flooded in, in ones and fives. And I think that's the thing to remember about readers as fans is that they are generous to a fault. And that's why I try to treat them like the, the, amazing people that they are and many of them have turned into real real true friends um but for patreon especially a lot of people support me just to support me they don't care where the dollar is going they i i had i was talking to somebody who was a patreon supporter and i said oh my it's so it's so kind of you it's you know you really make the difference in my life i hope that you like the essays and she said what essays she hadn't even really opened the emails to see that I sent out an essay every month. She just, I had just told everybody at one point that I had a Patreon and she's like, sure, here's a dollar, you know? Um, so I guess my long winded answer is I don't have something specific that can make us all a lot of money. I wish I did. Um, but treating the readers of any kind, I have kind of have them broken into two camps. I have my fiction readers and I have the people who follow me about writing stuff, um, the, the writers on my list, treating them like the extraordinary human beings who support me, who literally support me. So I owe them a debt um, of my service and of my honesty and of my time. It's just this beautiful two way street. And I do this with other writers that I love. You know, I support Patreon's or, or, you know, I just buy their book, even though I know I'm, I have no time to read it, but I'm going to buy it in hardcover and I'm going to buy it at someplace that is an Amazon. I'm going to buy it at an independent bookstore. Um, even though I don't read, I don't read hardcovers, but that is how I support them. Mm. And you know that, so I think that's a very strange answer to that question. No, but I love it. Um, and <laughs> I'm nodding along to so many of the things um, that you're saying, because I have a Patreon um, and I, I just love that you you can give to your patrons exactly what they want. So every single month I make a point of sending a message to say, what would you like me to talk about or write about this month? And I get to I get to do that and that is the best thing yeah. ever. And um this the, the thing I, I find scariest about it though is that I find I am bearing more and more of my soul um in these posts which I never intended to do. Um but oh, you have good. such a close connection, you know. So that last month I was talking about perfectionism and I I have a long history. <laughs> with perfectionism and yeah. it, it is just destructive and I was you know um I just you know I, I talked about all of my personal experiences and how I'd really felt about these things and I almost ironically didn't press submit because I was like this post is not perfect and it's on perfectionism how can I submit that but you know I had so many messages back from people saying you know, thank you. And this really connected more than anything else that I've read. And I was like, oh. that means more to me than anything, especially because I'd bared my soul, but also because it, it was something that they'd asked for. So oh, I just love, I love 
Patreon. Now, are these are these essays that you're providing, or are, are they <clears throat> not, videos? Or? Not, not. What? So that was that was. Yeah, I, it didn't. I didn't mean for it to be an essay, but it was essentially an essay. Um, yeah. So let's make sure we promote ourselves right now. Where's your Patreon? Patreon.com <laughs> slash Sasha Black. Okay, and yeah. mine is patreon.com slash Rachel, R-A-C-H-A-E-L. So that's out there. And this is another thing I encourage writers to do is sign up for other people's Patreons and see how they're doing it right and then steal those ideas for yourself. <laughs> this is how we do it. I follow Amanda Palmer just for that reason because she is so incredible at Patreon and, and she's so incredible at treating her fans like stars. Mm-hmm. And that is what I want to do too and and follow in that. So people should follow us. <laughs> Absolutely. Um I have just also, funny enough, because Amazon the bastard during the Black Friday sale got me with all of the two for one on audiobooks. I'm like, Amanda Palmer's Amanda Palmer's I've been she's been on my wish list for ages. <laughs> that is such a good book. Yeah. It's a beautiful book. It's oh I don't I I like her music, but I love her as a conduit for truth more than more than anything else and she's a little bit annoying on instagram but that's all right we all are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we we all have our i i mostly post about lampposts it's it's the whole thing um Lamp anyway <laughs> i wonder walk... about very expensive animals you know like cost dollars a month. <laughs> exactly we all have our weird nuances um okay so following on from that um the second Patreon question was, how do you choose and manage income streams that work well together without overwhelming or burning yourself out? And I think you've probably covered a little bit of that and the choices that you've made. But yeah, if there's anything yeah. else you can elaborate on. For those kind of things, it's just getting it wrong. It's just trying things, getting it wrong um, and realizing that in all aspects of our business, we are allowed to change our minds. Like I used to have a level um, at which I would, gosh, I would send them a postcard of thanks, you know. Um, whenever I traveled or something like that, I would send them a postcard. I'm the worst postcard letter mail person in the whole entire world. So I never fulfilled it. It never got done. And then one day I thought, oh, I can just change that to something else that it, I do not have to go to the post office for. And I changed it. And and that lesson in Patreon really taught me that lesson in my writing life that I'm. we are constantly trying to adjust. Oh, I have a prescription for you. Um, I read Denise, oh, I can't remember her last name. Uh, she's Australian. And this book is called, it's a terrible title, I apologize. It's called Chillpreneur. Oh, oh, so Katie, shout out to Katie Forrest. Hi, Katie. Um, she has actually posted me this book. And it is no on way. my, yeah, it's on my bedside table, ready to read. And I and I just, I, I it is uh, about two books down but yeah no, it, just move it to the top okay fine. Move it to okay, the top, fine. especially if you're dealing with any kind of burnout right now because I went on this vacation um last month and I re- and and I read it while we were gone and I realized oh I am hating being tied to this patreon coaching and my brain said it is one thousand dollars a month you absolutely cannot give that up and my next thought after reading this book was oh but I must so <laughs> it'll it will just make it work and I'm and I'm making it work and so yeah read that book and maybe <laughs> you'll make more money now less money like I did but it's but it's a beautiful way to remember that we get to change anything we want at any time and that's part of having a small business you know and giving ourselves permission because I'm one of these people that um I I'm very uh what's the word uh yin and yang in that I will rebel against any rule that is placed on me but at the same time sometimes I forget to give myself permission and get very stuck doing the thing that I think I have to do um right. so I just yourself. yeah I just I am just a complete contradiction in terms um but yeah giving yourself permission to change your mind I think is just such a valuable um lesson in business I think that for perfectionists, of, of which I am also one, um, it's it's even harder because, again, it is admitting, oh, I, I might have got that wrong. And I like to pretend that I never get anything wrong. Mm, and, mm. Know, that what I do you mean pretend? Wrong. I don't ever get anything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I think our wives might talk the same way about us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you are several years into being full time now. Congratulations. Um, and But I have heard a number of people say that year two is the hardest. Uh, I am seven months, I think, through my first year 
nobody died we still have a roof over our heads go me (laughs) um but what what can i do to prepare myself for this um because fuck me year one has been enough of a roller coaster like what am i getting into in year two like tell me tell me what i can do to prepare myself i i love this question because year one is made of adrenaline Year one is just trying to get to the anniversary to say that you did it. That's what it felt like to me. Just treading water, trying to bring in more money, trying to bring in different income streams, trying to do things differently, trying to do everything. Year two, however, is when I hit that burnout. So I think just and, and alcoholism, which I you know, which I was trying to cure the burnout with. Um, but I think just being knowledgeable that that is a fact for so many people is you know, forewarned is forearmed. You, you have to take better care of yourself in year two, because year two is when it sinks in that, Oh, I might be able to do this. And then it also sinks in, Oh, I might be able to do this. You know? <laughs> it just, it gets easier and scarier at the same time. Um, so if you're not good at taking breaks, you have to build in taking breaks. If you're not good at taking care of your body, for example, you have to get better at it. It's just, it's just not, it's not in question. You, you, you have to do it or you won't be able to continue. Mm. Um, I am 100% sure you will be able to continue and you have this knowledge. So what things, what things would you do differently in year two to take care of yourself better? Oh, oh, that's a real question. Yes. I, oh, oh, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. Geez, this is awkward. <laughs> Do you, um, do you overwork yourself or do you um, under eat or overeat or not exercise or? Um, or no. So, well, um, don't remember the last time I ate lunch. Um, <laughs> I, I, I do exercise. I, uh, I do Taekwondo and I see your yeah, shirt there. Yeah, just, see. just won the British championships for ladies in my belt Stop category. It. Yeah, I That's know. So I'm cool. like a total badass. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like a secret ninja. Um, well, things are also falling off of you. You're you're knocking also, them off. Also, yes, that might also have an impact. Um, Maybe also I, pick up swimming or something. Yeah, yeah, something less head kicky. Um, it's fine. I won nine nil. It's fine. And I, <laughs> that's amazing. Wow. Uh, um, and I meditate. So that's about pretty much the only things I do to look after myself in terms of. Um, working yeah all all of the hours i i'm now i've literally today i was like i need to schedule in evenings when i don't work um yeah no I, i've actually put them in the calendar that's the only <laughs> way i can do them is oh, okay it, i am such i'm i'm weird i'm either a workaholic or i have a migraine and i'm down but my my body just knocks my feet out from under me when i need to when i am when i am working too hard and i have a very hard time turning this off And it's in our house. This is in our house. So we can't really walk away and work is always there. And so sometimes now I actually close my computer and I leave my phone in another room and I go and have dinner and, you know, hang out with my wife. And and it just feels so wrong. But we have to. Mm. We just have to. Mm. I'm going to work on that one. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Okay. So another going back to money then. I am really interested at the moment and I feel like. I have a book brewing on money. Um, although yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know if I'm the right person to write it. I don't know if I don't, I, I don't know. Anyway, I feel like if it's brewing, you probably are the right person. And, yeah. and you know how we learn things in order to write books. Okay. Yeah. Well, exactly. And, and, you know, I'm, I've just come through one end of the journey and now I want to make all the money. So you know, I want to do yeah. the other end of the journey, which brings me to my question. Um, I am really interested in how authors level up their business. So what do you think are the key steps you took to, t- to take your business from, you know, tens to hundreds to hundreds to thousands a month to ten thousands of month, uh, to, you know, that thing. <laughs> what are words? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are words? <laughs> yeah, you know, to a six figure business. What, what are the key things you did that you think had the biggest impact on leveling up your business? For, that's, a, that's a great question. And for me, it was really realizing the limited ability I have to help everyone and thinking about uh, what I do in terms of writing and in assisting other writers uh, in terms of scalability. I, 
if you, if you, if I was helping everyone on a one-off basis for half an hour at a time, I'm not very, I may not making that much money and I'm exhausting myself. Um, so making that actual choice to put that time back into writing, which is something that becomes then intellectual property, which is something that I can then harness and do at least five things off the top of my head with, you know, out there. Um, it is why I'm currently working on making more courses. I only have one course out there and it brings me a steady stream of money every month. And it has since I put it out there since before I quit my day job. So probably five years ago. And I just need to do more courses rather than working with people one-on-one. -on -one, I'm building courses. I'm, I'm just writing more because that's the part that is scalable. Um, I'm doing this. I just, I, I like to think creatively and I like to challenge myself. And so when I took that thousand dollar hit for Patreon, I thought, well, what can I do that would be fun for me that might bring in a little bit of money and is scalable. Um, so I'm doing this thing. I just started it this week and I have, I think 10 people signed up or maybe nine people so far. Um, but they pay me $49 a month. We get together at five goddamn AM in the morning on the west coast of the US and we write together for two hours. So what I'm doing is I'm showing up, uh, we write together in a Zoom room so we can all see each other in the little in the little images. I talk, I encourage, they get into little groups and talk amongst each other and then we just write. So what is, what is happening now? I am getting paid to encourage people on a scalable basis. There could be 4,000 people in that room. It doesn't matter how many there are. Um, I would love to have 4,000. I don't think that's gonna happen. <laughs> But I'm also getting my own writing done. During our two writing sessions, I'm just sitting there with the camera on, typing on my work, getting words. Um, instead of trying to expand into another coaching or teaching opportunity, I'm trying to look at ways to be scalable and to make myself happy and get my own work done at the same time. Oh, I'm having so many epiphanies. So this was <laughs> this what this is really the crux of the editing because I yes, absolutely adore um so my my personal passion is craft and I have been told I am forensic at times because I deconstruct every book I ever read and I'm writing a book now called The Anatomy of Prose just because mm. I I collect sentences I <clears throat> excuse me I've written blogs for years about you know, how somebody does foreshadowing or how they've created characterization down at the sentence level or whatever. Anyway, um, so that was how I ended up falling into editing. Um, but it's so time intensive and you're only helping one person. And it's frustrating because I want to help everyone. <laughs> you <laughs> simply need to write more books about how to write better books. Right. But, and that's the epiphany I just had right now yeah. because I'm like, oh yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Like I just need to, <laughs> to, to stop doing the thing, which is one-on-one -on -one and do the thing, which is one to many. Um, and, and but also, then, and if, oh, sorry, sorry, no, no, go, go ahead. I was just going to say, in terms of intellectual property, every time you write a book, that is another piece of, that is another thing to turn into a course. And people yeah. don't buy either the course or the book, they buy both because mm -hmm. that's what we do as humans. That's what I do when I find somebody whose voice I resonate with, I buy everything. Mm -hmm. I just want all of the things that they've written about, right? In, in terms of craft, in terms of storytelling and in terms of this business. But I interrupted you, go on. Oh no, well, no, I was I was just going to say, so, so I've, <clears throat> I've sort of got three or four course ideas, but um, I just need to get over myself and the imposter syndrome and the perfectionism. <laughs> just get them fucking done. Because um, I've, I've started say number of times and I just can't get myself to the finish line. But um, it's that's... hard. Courses yeah. are so much work. Yeah. That's the thing that I've been putting off for a while. They're just so much work and no one can do them but us. Yes. I, cannot, I can't hire that out to my VA. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. Oh. Um, okay, my favourite question. This is the Rebel Author Podcast. So, tell me about a time you unleashed your inner rebel. <sighs> I looked over your questions, but I like to kind of surprise myself like I, like we do on the writers well, so I didn't think too deeply about it. But I, But this is the answer that occurred to me when I looked at them, and it's occurring to me now, and it's dull. I'm sorry I'm a boring person a lot of times. But quitting my job was the, the biggest fuck you I have ever given to anything because I was raised – from a blue collar, hardworking family and you went to job and you took your paycheck and you went home and you lived your life. And that is how my, you know, dad retired that, that way. And I 
had I had never lost a job. You know, since I got out of grad school, I had worked continuously, always more than fifty hours a week, no matter which. I had three long term jobs after after grad school, um, it, all in the same uh, kind of subset of what I was doing, which was nine one one, and and to quit felt like the ballsiest, stupidest most terrible thing that I had ever done. Like it was just not acceptable for me as a human being who should be a contributing member of society and, you know, pay, you know, get paid by the man and take it home to actually say, no, I quit. And to go out onto this, this high wire and try to balance there, you know, I'm picturing like the wind blowing me and how dare I do that. And the day that I, the day that I went in and told my manager that I was quitting, um, number one, she was stunned. Uh, number two, she almost talked me into staying. Number three, oh. I had to go home from that shift with a migraine. I stressed myself into a <laughs> migraine because I was so upset about this, this anathema thing that I was doing. My whole goal, my whole adult life had been not to lose a job, like to do everything perfectly so I would never lose a job. And here I was losing a job on purpose. I know, but I, isn't I, it I don't wonderful? Want your six figures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How did it go for you when you quit? Um, my boss knew. I sat oh, okay. I sat down and he and he just it must have been written all over my face like the biggest ha ah, fuck you, I'm going, see you, fuck goodbye. <laughs> you know, uh, because he was like, Oh, you're leaving, aren't you? And I was like, Yeah <laughs> See, but you are this is such an interesting question the way you ask it too, because you are a rebel. If you're looking at like Gretchen Rubin's for tendencies i'm sure you're a rebel my yeah. wife is a rebel yeah. i am an upholder oh. i uphold everyone's expectations about myself including my own and so to throw a good job into the air like that i'm still i'm still shaking almost four years later so that was uh, that was a, a rebel thing that i did yeah no but it's and it's just one of the best i love hearing people's i quit stories so I like too. yeah i absolutely love it i um yeah the rebel thing is so funny i am so rebellious i will all, also argue with myself over over things like it's just it's so it's infuriating i if i try it's like deadlines like i love so my myers briggs is a, i'm an entj although i'm ei borderline so i'm Sometimes I'm really I and then sometimes I'm really E. But um, so I really like structure and deadlines. But God damn it, if I put a deadline on myself, I will do everything to rebel against it. Like, it's just, <laughs> what is wrong with me? <laughs> like, oh, my God. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, for you, not for me. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so tell readers where they can find out more about you and your books and your Patreon and your podcasts and all of your things. Uh, everything can be found at rachelheron.com and of interest to your listeners might be the For Writers tab. Um, and I send, I have an email, which I normally send out, a weekly uh, email of encouragement, which I haven't been doing recently because I have been just lazing around. Um, but there's that. Uh, Patreon is patreon.com slash Rachel. I also lead retreats. Um, and that's a fun one. If you want to sign up for the writers, I'm going to Barcelona in April. And I think I still have a couple slots there. So that's all available from the For Writers page on rachelhair.com. Oh, and the podcasts are The Writers Well, uh, which I co-host with Jay Thorne. And we just talk about the experience of being a writer and we always bring one of us brings the other a question that they don't know about in advance and then we have to really talk about it and we are very honest they can be very very deep hard, difficult questions and they can be very light and softball luckily he softballed me yesterday so that's that's <laughs> excellent um and then my podcast is just called how do you write and i speak with writers about their processes because i'm always looking for the magic bullet that will make my own process easy and i haven't found it yet so i'm gonna keep the podcast going yeah. and at some point <laughs> sasha black will be on there too Oh, shucks. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I was drooling listening to you talk about Venice, by the way. I was like, oh, God, I so want to go to Venice. But uh, yeah, that sounded amazing. I've done that a few times. That'll be 2021. I'll be going back there. So. Don't, don't tell yeah. me that. Don't, don't, don't. You're don't, don't. Away. You're away. <laughs> no, I know. I know. That's why don't tell me because then I have to confront my wife over it. Um, <laughs> That's the hard part. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. And thank you also to all of the patrons supporting the show. If you would like to get early access to all of the episodes, as well as exclusive and bonus Patreon-only content, you can do so by going to www.patreon.com forward slash Sasha Black. Thank and she you. really appreciates that, you guys. She really, really does. You should go join. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> <laughs> I love you guys. Um, <laughs> thank you to everybody listening. Thank you to our wonderful guest today. I'm Sasha Black. You are listening to Rachel Heron, and this was the Rebel Author Podcast. Next week, I'm going to be talking to Gabriella Pereira. Gabriella is the founder of DIY MFA, a do-it-yourself master of fine arts. Lots of us think that we need a creative degree in order to be writers, but actually that is a misnomer. And Gabriella is going to bust that myth and show you how you can educate yourself to the same level without spending thousands and thousands of pounds. I'm excited for you guys to listen to this. Gabriella is ridiculously um, clever. Her brain is huge. She knows so much about the craft and I can't wait to share all of that with you next week. Don't forget to tune in and subscribe on your podcatcher. And when you have a moment, please leave a review. (music) 